and give God another hand of praise. Amen. If you have your Bibles, if you have your Bibles, we ask that you come and go with us. Come and go with us to Second Kings in the Old Testament, the book of Second Kings. The book of Second Kings. And that fourth chapter. Book of Second Kings and that fourth chapter. Second Kings. Fourth chapter. Beginning in that first verse, if you found it, say amen. amen. Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the, son of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead, and thou knowest that thou servant did fear the Lord. And the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. And Elisha said unto her, what shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in the house? And she said, thine handmaid had not anything in the house save a pot of oil. Then he said, go borrow the vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels and borrow not a few. Which means don't just get a few of them. You get as many as you can get. And Elisha went ahead and told him that fourth verse. And when thou art come in. Thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons. Make sure they in the house also. And shalt pour out unto all those vessels. And thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went in. She went from him. And shut the door upon her and upon her sons who brought the vessels to her and she poured out. Verse six says, and it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said unto her son, bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, there is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. Then she came and told the man of God and he said, go sell the oil and pay thy debt and live thou and thy children of the rest. You may be seated. Amen. 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 We'd like to speak to you from a thought today. Rut. Rot and revival. Rut, R-U-T, comma, rot, R-O-T, comma, and revival. R-E-V-I-V-A-L. Amen. Rut, rot, and revival. I want to go ahead and, and jump into this, this text because a very familiar text. We, we find this, this woman who is in a, a, a predicament that many individuals and, and families find themselves in from, from time to time. She is in what we call a rut. And, and I know most of you know what, what a rut is. A, a rut is a place where you, you feel stuck. You, you feel helpless, you feel hopeless, you feel like there's no way to escape, there's no way out. It's a, it's a terrible and, and frustrating place because many times you feel that, that you've done nothing wrong to get in the rut. Amen, you feel that, that it's not your fault that you're in a rut, you fail in a place that you, you didn't intend to fall into, but, but you felt that it might have been your lot in life and you didn't even have to do anything wrong to get into that place. And things about being in a rut is that being in a rut can make you lose some sleep at night. 
wish I had some help in here. Being in a rut can cause you to have to take some, some Prozac or some, some Xanax, some nerve medicine. Being in a rut will, will cause you to be irritable and hard to get along with. You're not your happy-go-lucky self like you used to be all because you're going through a rut. Amen. And the worst thing about being in a rut is that if you don't find a way out of that rut, your rut will turn into a rot. Mm. In other words, a, a, a rut, unless you find a way to get out of it, will rob you of joy, life, peace, happiness, and it'll leave you in a dead and rotting place. Do I have a witness in here? And see, and it's the kind of place that this widow woman found herself in. Amen. She, she, she's here in the scripture. This is a, a, a poor widow woman that's in a desperate situation. And she's trying to raise her family all by herself because evidently since she's a widow woman, her husband has died. And we do know that, that the Bible tells us that he was, he was one of the sons of the prophets, which means that he was a preacher and he's died. Amen. He was one of, of, Elijah, of Elisha's disciples. He was one who was being trained how to be a prophet and he's dead and he's left her all alone to raise these two boys. And, and, and some of you may be able to attest to this where you didn't have daddy there or you didn't have a husband there or somebody to help you raise your children and you had to do it all by yourself. And this is where this woman finds herself. Her husband has died. And apparently when he died, he left her with a mountain of debt. They had gotten a lot of stuff based on his income. And now he's dead and the money is not coming in. But those bills still got to be paid. Y'all talk to me in here. A -a Amen. How many of you know that bills can mess with your mind? Be be being in debt can put you in a mental rut. A Amen. I, I, I don't know about you, but but how I used to get paid, I used to get paid once a month and getting paid that once a month had to last to the end of the month. And sometimes I find that there's more month than there is. Y'all, somebody know what I'm talking about in here. A amen. And it starts messing with your mind sometimes. It has your mind thinking crazy stuff about what you can do in order to make ends meet. But somehow it seemed that the end <laughs> never would meet. So you go into a mental rut. And here this woman, the Bible tells us that she finds herself in such a financial trouble that the sheriff is now coming to her house, knocking on the door and say, if you can't pay your bills, we're going to take your children instead. And we're going to hold your children until the debt is paid. See, and don't think that this is any, anything strange during this time because well, was during that time, during the Bible days, if, if somebody owes a bill or somebody had a debt to somebody, they can take their children or a family member and hold them or sell them into slavery to pay the debt. Thank God they don't have that around here like that with us because half of us wouldn't be in the house today. Lord knows I know if it would have come to my family. A amen. And mom and daddy was in so much debt, they come there knocking on the door, said, you're going to have to give us a couple of children. I probably would have been the first one they pushed out the door. <laughs> but my mama said that I was so bad, they probably pay them to take them and pay me back. <laughs> 
Amen. <laughs> this widow woman, she does what so many of us have learned to do. She found herself in a rut. And the first thing that she found, she did in her despair, the Bible says, is that she reached out for the man of God. She came to Elisha, who was the prophet in the room at that time. She came to Elisha. And I don't know about you, but it's good to have a preacher in your corner every now and then. I ain't talking about just some average bootleg now. I'm talking about somebody who you know know God. Somebody who got a good relationship with the Lord. It's good to have a preacher in your corner, but, 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 but you got to realize, you got to recognize that that preacher is human too. And that preacher get tired every now and then also. Can I get a witness in here? And, and as a pastor, every now and then I get tired from time to time. But I need to tell you, if if you know how to pray, you can get out of the rut yourself. Oh, y'all ain't going to talk to me. A -a -a Amen. But I give this woman credit, though. This woman got in touch with somebody who knew how to get in touch with heaven. Uh, are y'all with me in here? Amen. And even if you know how to pray yourself, sometimes it's good to be able to touch and agree with somebody else. Remember a couple of weeks ago, I, I, a couple of weeks ago, one of my Wednesday night, Wednesday night messages said the power of, of, of prayer meeting. Sometimes it's good. It's good to pray by yourself. But when you get two or three gathered in his name, He'll be somewhere in the midst. The Bible says that one can send a thousand to flight, but two can send 10,000 to flight. There's something about collective prayer that will give you power. So she came to the man of God and she said, she said, I need for you to pray for me. I, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. And, and, and I need for you to get to heaven and to go to heaven for me. A amen. And the Bible says that the widow woman called Elisha and she called on Elijah and she asked him to help her out of this situation. Now, this was an impossible situation. She didn't have anything to sell. She didn't have a job. No income was coming in. So what this woman needed was a miracle. Have you ever been in a place in a rut that nobody could help you? And if God didn't do it, it couldn't be done. This woman here finds herself needing a miracle. And watch Elijah. Well, Elijah, when she came to him, he said, what you want, what you want me to do for you? And then he asked her a, 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 a strange question. She had already told him, I ain't got nothing in my house. I don't have a job. I ain't got nothing to sell. I have nothing. And then Elijah asked her a strange question. He said, well, what you got in your house? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yes. Uh -huh. What is in the house? Remember that. He asked her the question, what is in the house? Because you might have something in the house. That just might help you. There might be something in the house that might be the solution to all your problems. Now, look at what this lady said. This lady said, well, doggone it, I just told you. I ain't got nothing in my house. Oh, oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I got a little bit of oil in the pot in my house. And that's all I got. I ain't got nothing else. I just got a little bit of oil in a pot. And you know what? Of course, this is one of those Old Testament stories that, that that's rich in meaning. And, and you've probably heard this passage preached a lot so many times. And, and you know that the widow gathers up all these empty jars from her neighbors. And, and then, then she go in the house and close the door behind her. And, and then God does a miracle. She took the oil or the pot and she start pouring it in a jar. And when it fills up, he said, come on, baby, bring me another one. And it fills up and said, come on, baby, bring me another one. And she kept on pouring and the oil kept on flowing. As long as she had an empty jar, the oil kept on flowing. And then when she asked her son, bring me another one. He said, Mama, I ain't got no more. 
And when she said, I ain't got no more, the oil stopped. She went back to the man of God and said, I got all these jars filled just like you told me. He said, all right, take what you have, sell it, get enough money to pay off your debts, and then live off the rest for the rest of your life. God done provided so much that you can pay off all your debts and you got enough left over to be good for the rest of your life. Ain't God all right? And most of the time we can stop it right there. Hallelujah. We can stop it right there, but, 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 but there, there, there's, there, there's something else I see. There, there, there's another message. That, 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 that I see just, just below the surface. You got, you got to look deep with me. You got to, you got to look right there. It's kind of thin, but, but you got to look and find it. There are symbols in this story. And you know, a lot of times, just like with Isaiah telling his prophecies, there were symbols. It was symbolic of certain things. And, and just like Elijah, or just like the writer here, when, when Elijah, in this, in this situation, it was symbolic of certain things. First of all, when we have the prophet Elijah, Elisha was symbolic or representative of Jesus Christ because she needed help and she knew where to go to find help. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know about you, but every now and then when I find myself in a rut, I have to look into the hills. <laughs> From which cometh my help. The hymn writer said, Father, I stretch my hands to thee. No other help. I know Elisha was a type of Christ because she came to him because she was in a desperate situation. Are y'all with me? Amen. And, and now she has some oil in the house. The oil was in the house. The oil was in the house, which is a symbol of the Holy Ghost. Uh, y'all, y'all, y'all still with me. A amen. Which is a symbol of the Holy Ghost. And then and then I don't think that it's stretching it a little bit to suggest that that the house that she was in represents the modern church. And the widow herself represents the folks of the present generation of believers in Christ. Are, are y'all are y'all with me? Now stay with me. Stay with me. Now notice this woman was in danger of losing her children. Her children represents the next generation. Now watch this. She was going to lose them to the creditor. The creditor represents the world that's outside of her door ready to snatch her children away from her because there's nothing in the house. Oh, boy. Mm. Could it be? Could it be that when one generation allows God's house to become empty, that the next generation pays the price. Could it be that we are in danger of losing our children to the world because we've neglected to show them the power of God at work in and through the church? Just some scattered remarks I'm making right there. These are some heavy questions. And I don't mean to come on too strong today, but, but, but let's take a good solid look at ourselves. The question is, are we leaving a legacy of Christianity or are we simply preparing our children for a rut? That can lead to a rot. Unless we lead them out now with a revival. See, that's why the word says in Proverbs 22 and 6, it says train up a child. 
in the way he should go. And when he's old, he will not depart from it. You know, because a lot of times we, 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 we get guilty of this sometimes, my sister and brother. It's sad, but it's true. In some places in this country, the game is already over. Children don't even come to church anymore. Amen, somebody. But we got to get back into the practice of bringing our children to church and not just sending them to church or what's worse, we come to church and leave them little boogers home in the bed. See, y'all ain't saying that now. We, get a, get, we got to get back to that philosophy that Joshua said in Joshua 24, as for me and my house. Boy, I wish I had a Bible reader with me. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So if you're living under my roof, if you're living under my roof, I don't care if you're 10 or 30, if you're living under my roof, eating my food, using my electricity, drinking my water, you gonna get your behind up on Sunday morning. But see, thank God, I, ain't, I don't have no problem with him. He's up and ready. He's up and ready to go. He, wait, he, he ain't waiting on me now, but he's up and ready to go. <laughs> but we are losing our children because we are bring, we're not bringing them in the house of the Lord like we should. Now get this, get this. Once we get them in the house, then we don't have anything in the house to give them. Ooh. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. Notice what the prophet told the woman. The prophet says in the fourth verse, he said, then he said, then go. He said, he said, go and get pots and pans, vessels. To pour stuff in, get that, get that little bit you got. Get pots, pans, vessels. And then when you get it, I want you to go inside, shut the door behind you and your sons. I want you to bring them in the house with you and start pouring the oil in the vessels. And as each one of them fill up, put it to the side, get another one and fill it up. The prophet told the woman that when you get all these vessels and then bring these vessels, these empty vessels in the house, close the door behind you and then allow the oil to flow into those empty vessels. Now watch this. That, that sounds familiar because in Matthew 6, when Jesus' disciples said, teach us how to pray, as John taught his disciples to pray, Jesus says, when you pray, he said, go into your closet. And when you go into the closet, you shut the door behind you and have a little talk with Jesus. So here is a prescription telling when you go into the house or when you go into prayer, close the door behind you. Parents, we need to bring our children along with us to the place of prayer. Yes. 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 There's nothing wrong with bringing your child with you and pray. I know me and Junior don't pray every morning, but every now and then we're going to grab hands. We're going to pray one another. We should be praying not only just for our children, but we should be praying with our children. We need to shut the door behind us and we need to pour out our hearts to the Lord until his Holy Spirit starts to flow. Now watch this. When we go into prayer and close the door, that means anything that can be a distraction, we need to leave it outside. 
get off that game, put that phone up, whatever else, your tablet, your laptop, whatever else, we need to have a little talk with Jesus. Boy, I wish I had some help up in here. See, I'm talking right now, and some, some, some kids may be on their phones right now while we're sitting up in here, and parents sitting right next to them and ain't saying a word. You, 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 you in this house, so, you know, I, I say anything that come to me that the Lord allow me to say. A, 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 amen. Remember, while they're in the house, you are responsible for them. And then it just ain't even in my notes. Hey, amen. <laughs> when you bring them in and have prayer with them, you prevent that rut from becoming a rot because you're giving them revival. Are y'all with me? Let, me? let me go ahead. Let me go ahead and finish this. Let me go ahead. My, my, my prayer, my prayer today is for this to happen in all of our families that we make up in our minds that that we're not going to stop seeking the Lord because we want every member of our family. We want them saved. From the least to the greatest, we want them saved. And if it's still in our power to bring them in the house, we need to bring them in the house. Remember, you are responsible for your child for raising them in the way that they should go. Can I get a witness in here? Because when fathers get saved, then they'll train their sons to be godly men and good fathers themselves. Boy, I should have got a big amen from the women. If mothers get saved, then they will train their daughters and other young ladies how to be godly wives first and then good mothers second. Come on and talk to me up in here. When brothers or young men get saved, then they'll become spiritual role models for other young brothers. When young sisters get saved, when they get saved, when they get saved, they'll become spiritual role models and mentors for our younger sisters. They will start teaching them how to dress modest in front of the Lord, how to conduct yourself, how to carry yourself as a young woman of God. And when this happens, when this happens, those ruts and those rots will turn into revival. Can I, can I get a witness in here? Just a little recap of what it is about ruts, rots, and revival. Clear indication of something going on here in this fourth chapter of 2 Kings. The Bible says that this woman finds herself in a mess. She's in a rut. The creditors are knocking on the door saying, because you owe this debt, we're going to take your sons away from you. So her rut was about to become a rot. But because this woman, she knew where to run to. She knew where her help come from. The Bible says that she ran to the man of God. And when she went to Elisha, she told Elisha, said, man of God, I'm in a desperate situation. And I need the Lord to help me. 
Because if the Lord don't help me, there's no other help that I know. Ain't the Lord on range? And I heard Elijah ask this woman. He said, woman, what do you have in your house? The woman said, I ain't got nothing but a pot with a little bit of oil in it. That might not mean anything to some of you. But to me, it shows me that God can take your little bits and make it more than enough. Ain't the Lord all right? I know that she didn't have any jewelry that she could pawn. She didn't have any stocks or bonds. But all she had was a little oil in the pots. And the next thing that they tell me, that God can use what you got. If you're faithful and put it in his hands, God can make it more than enough. Ain't the Lord all right? For the Bible tells me that Jesus had preached a good sermon one day. And there were 5,000 men, not counting the women and the children. And Jesus said, sit them on the grass so we can feed them with what we have. I heard the disciples say that we don't have enough food. Jesus said, well, what you got? I heard one said there's a little boy with two fish and five loaves of bread. I heard Jesus say, well, that's enough. Just put it into my hands. And the Lord said a prayer over those two fish and five loaves. When we learn how to put things in the hands of the Lord, the Lord will bless it and make it more than enough. Ain't the Lord all right? I heard Elijah tell the woman, the oil is all that you need. But what I want you to do, I want you to go to your neighbor's house. And I want you to ask them to let you hold some empty pots and pans. And don't just borrow a few of them. I want you to get as many as you can. I want you to know today that God knows how to use other folks to be a blessing in your life. Ain't the Lord all right? I heard that the women got her boys and they went from house to house asking Sister Martha for a pot, asking Sister Mary for a pan. She got jaws and she got vases. She brought them back into her house. The Bible says that when she got in the house, she closed the door behind her. Every now and then, when you're calling on the name of the Lord, you have to go in your secret place and shut out the world behind you. You have to shut out all of the distractions. You have to shut out all of the sin. You have to shut out everything that can disturb your spirit. Ain't the Lord all right? And when you get into the house, just have faith and watch the Lord work. Ain't the Lord all right? I heard that the woman took that little bit of oil. But when she placed it by faith in the hands of the Lord, when she began to pour that oil, the oil came out and it just kept on pouring. Ain't the Lord all right? I thought she only had a little bit. But when God gets involved, he makes it more than enough. Say yes. Say yes. That reminds me of when the widow woman and her son was about to die, who had a little bit of meal in the barrel and a little bit of oil in the cruise. But the man of God, by the name of Elijah, said, feed me first. Whatever you have, give it to God first and watch God work in your life. Say yes, say yes. I heard that she put that meal to work along with that oil in the bed. And when she cooked that cake 
and went back to the barrel. There was still some meal in the barrel. There was still some oil in the jar. That lets me know that whatever I put in the hands of the Lord, the Lord will keep it. The Lord will sustain it. But my God shall supply all your need and glory. Say yes. Say yes. I heard when she had filled up all the jars, she went back to Elisha. Elijah said, go and sell that oil. And whatever you have left, it's going to be enough for you to live the rest of your life. That lets me know that if I trust God with my life, he holds my future in his hand. He walks with me. He talks with me. He tells me. He tells me that whenever I get in a rut, don't dwell on that rut to let it turn into a rot. But go in your closet. Close your door and have some revival time. Boy, I wish I had a few witnesses in here that know that you were in a mess, but when you bowed your knees down and called on the name of Jesus, didn't he pick you up? Turn you around. 